Good morning and welcome to the Crops TV presentation for this week. The topic is Integrated Weed Management Update for 2021. So I am Prashant Jha. I'm the Extension Weed Specialist uh, with the Department of Agronomy at Iowa State University, Extension and Outreach. Today I'm going to uh, give you uh, some uh, a picture of the new herbicide products for 2021. Uh, we have a, I have a two-page uh, document right here. Uh, we have a pretty uh, good many prod new herbicide products for 2021 that is uh, that will be available for corn and soybean growers. Impact core, core from AMVAC, uh, which is again a herbicide group 27 and 15 combination for corn. Uh, as a post product, we have Synet, another uh, product from MVAC, with, which has topramazone and glufosinate, uh, should be applied as a post application uh, for in Liberty Link corn, not in, uh, in other corn, because we have glufosinate in the mix. Uh, Perpetua from Valent, which is pyroxysulfone and flumiclorac, uh, with a combination of group 15 and 14, available both for corn and soybean as a pre product. Uh, Reviton, which is from Helm Agro, uh, Typhenacil, it is also a, a PPO uh, kind of inhib uh, PPO inhibitor, group 14, available for corn and soybean as a pre plant burn down only product. So, uh, Kyber, which is a new product from Cotiva, uh, which is a combination of flumioxazine, metribuzin, and pyroxysulfone. Uh, again, uh, multiple sites of action with group 14, group 5, and group 15, available for soybean market, applied as a pre emerges product. Tough IVC, you might have heard about that last year also from Belsim Crop Protection, uh, active ingredient pyridate, group 6, a new product available as for post emergence in corn. Coming to some of the other uh, new products which, is, which are going to be, be available for 2021 is Antares Complete, which is from Helena, and it is metribuzin, sulfentrazone, and s metallocular again a combination of group 5, 14, and 15, uh, available for soybean as a pre-emergence product. Empiro, Empiros, which is again from Helena Chemicals, uh, with the topyrelate and metallochlor, group 27 and group 15, available as a as a pre and e post application for corn in 2021. Uh, Syngena has some of the new products coming into the pipeline, which are more based on Acuron, uh, as you all are aware of this uh, Acuron, which is a bicyclopyrone based uh, uh, herbicide product. So they have Acuron XR, Acuron Flexi XR, uh, which is again uh, supposed to be or uh, launched in 2021. It is currently not uh, registered, but it's supposed to be uh, coming. Uh, some, sometime in 2021 as a pre-emergence product. Again, multiple sites, three to four herbicide sites of action applied as a pre-emergence product in corn. We have Zone Defense from Helm Agro, which is again a combination of sulfentrazone and flumioxazine. Both are the PPO inhibitors, group 14, available for soybean as a pre or a pre-planned burn down products. Again, so that's exciting that we have some new herbicide products uh, coming for the 2021 soybean growing season and corn growing season as well. Uh, majority of these products, if you whether you talk about pre-emergence or post-emergence, they are pre-mixes. They are multiple sites of action herbicides. Uh, that's because that's where we are going when we are talking about managing herbicide-resistant weeds. So uh, three uh, three major triple stacked herbicide tolerant traits for for weed control, especially for controlling hard to control weeds like water hemp in in in. Uh, in soybean for 2021, we will have this extended flex soybeans again uh, uh, th that has been uh, approved by EPA and, and is registered in, and will be available as a triple stack uh, technology for soybeans with Roundup Power Max, Extending Max, which is the Kemba and Liberty Glufosinate application. Uh, we all know about Liberty Link GT27, which again gives us the flexibility to apply glyphosate and Liberty in the same tank. Uh, uh, I would like to emphasize that the LE27, which is the HPPD group 27 herbicide, uh, to be, uh, that is not uh, currently registered. It is still pending registration. Uh, it, it got limited registration in some states and, uh, with limited counties, but not in Iowa yet. So, uh, Enlist E3 soybeans, we are going to see an increase in the Enlist E3 soybeans in, in Iowa. Uh, in the 2021 growing season, of course, uh, in line with extend flex soybeans. Again, Enlist E3 soybeans is triple stacked with glyphosate, Enlist 1 and Liberty. 
I would like to mention here that Enlist and Liberty should be applied as a tank mix for control of these troublesome weeds like, like water hemp when we talk about. Uh, uh, standalone, we have based on our research, Enlist 1 or Liberty as a standalone is, is not very effective. You will see a lot of regrowth and potential failures, but when they are applied as a tank mix, as Enlist and Liberty tank mix, they definitely are more effective uh, for controlling water hemp. So regardless of uh, these uh, triple stacked uh, or multiple stacked herbicide tolerant trait technologies that we have in the market uh, to fight herbicide resistant weeds, we definitely need to, to be uh, careful in terms of using these new technologies for future use. Uh, and, and the recommendation is use of layered soil residual herbicide programs. With, we definitely need to have that with multiple sites of action or herbicide groups that will serve as a foundation for uh, preserving the utility and sustainability of these new trade technologies going into the future. Now I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, survey of, of uh, water hemp populations that we did into, in the fall of 2019 and we continued uh, some of that also in 2020. Uh, we collected close to 250 populations from corn and soybean fields across Iowa and some of these populations also came from grower fields because lack of uh, control from uh, some of these products used in corn and soybean. So in this slide, you see the, uh, I'm uh, showing you the results for the 70 out of those 250 populations that we have screened so far. Uh, uh, those, uh, her uh, those herbicides on the x-axis or the group numbers were the herbicide group two, which was pursued. Uh, and other group two herbicides, which we all are aware of. Group five, atrazine, group nine, uh, which is glyphosate. Group 14, the PPO herbicides like Flexstar or Cobra or Ultra Blazer. Group 27 is the HVPD chemistry, which is again, uh, well-known herbicides like Callisto, uh, Impact and, and uh, et cetera in, in that particular group. So on the y-axis, we see the percent of the populations. Out of those 70 populations, we saw based on our screening, uh, the, uh, for group two, five, and nine, we had more than 95% of those populations right now are resistant to those three groups. So, and, and uh, those yellow bar, uh, orange bars represents the populations that were tested at the 4X rate. 4X rate means that they were applied at four times the field use rate. So we, we are pretty confident that those are resistance. That's why you see the term confirmed resistance. So pretty high frequency for those uh, glyphosate, as you can see here. But again, for group 14 and group 27, uh, at the 4x rate, uh, we are seeing that only less than 20% of the populations are uh, out of those 70 populations of a resistance. So still we are dealing with a low frequency there, but again, it is concerned. But if, when, when you are doing it at a 2x rate, for example, or a fill use rate, of course, you would be expecting somewhere in the range of 20 to 30% of those populations being resistant to PPO and HPPD herbicides. On the right-hand side, we uh, see the yellow bars with the herbicide group 4, and we tested uh, some of the survivors uh, uh, that, that produce seed in the field. We tested those uh, at uh, the field use rate, 1x rate, in the greenhouse in our screening program. And uh, for, uh, for these two uh, uh, group 4 herbicides, 2,4-D and dicamba, and less than 10%, uh, I would say, of those populations, of, out of those 70 populations, let, less than 10% were uh, survived the field use rate of 2,4-D and dicamba, which is, again, a concern. We, we definitely, on, on, on the right-hand side, you see the picture uh, of those 2,4-D and dicamba survivors at the 1x rate, and they, were, they did produce seed. Which is, which is a big concern. So we are, uh, we are getting this next generation uh, screening for, uh, of those populations for 2,4-D and dicamba so that we can confirm whether they are truly resistant or not. And, and if they are resistant, what is the level of resistant, resistance they have developed uh, against 2,4-D and dicamba? So right now we are in the uh, phase where we are seeing more and more multiple herbicide resistant water in Iowa and across the Midwest. And again, for Iowa, based on our screening of those uh, populations, uh, two-way and three-way resistance, more than 95% of those populations, uh, or more than 90% of those populations, we are seeing two to three-way resistance. Close to 20% of the populations, uh, they had four-way resistance. 
uh, which means they were resistant to the group 2s, uh, group 5 atrazine, glyphosate, group 14 or group 27, which is the PPO and HPPD herbicides. Uh, group 5, 5-way uh, resistance, we also uh, are still working on this, but again, there was a uh, uh, few populations, I would say 1 to 2% of the populations that also have, uh, had survivors from group 2. So that adds to that 5-way uh, resistant water hemp. Uh, populations. Again, we need to be more proactive in terms of uh, using some of these products which are right now effective like 2,4-D Decamba and Liberty uh, because six-way resistant water hemp has been reported in Midwest with resistance to 2,4-D, uh, reported in Missouri and Illinois. Uh, and, and for all these uh, cases of new cases of multiple resistance, we are seeing enhanced metabolism as the major, uh, as the major mechanism uh, conferring multiple resistance, that, uh, for example, group resistance to group 4, five, group 5, atrazine 15, which is uh, um, S-metylochlor or acetochlor, uh, and group 27, which, is, uh, which are the HPPD herbicides, we are seeing this metabolism-based mechanism. So definitely, uh, we need to be more proactive in terms of uh, what tools we have and how best we can utilize utilize those herbicide tools and preserve the utility of those tools. So at that point, with limited herbicide options and understanding that no new side of actions are coming in the marketplace for the next, uh, uh, I would say, 8 to 10 years, we definitely need to look at alternative strategies uh, and, and how we can integrate weed management programs in, in the Iowa corn and soybean production systems. So. So from this point onwards, I'm going to talk about some of the, res, uh, res, uh, I will show you some of the results and also talk about some of the research that we conducted uh, in corn and soybean, uh, looking at some of these integrated weed management programs other than herbicides, and how best we can integrate those with the existing herbicide programs. So in this, uh, this research was started in back in 2019 in a corn soybean two year rotation, uh, where the experimental design was a split split plot and uh, we conduct, we had two sites, one at the ISU Curtis farm and one at the Bruner farm. The main plot was uh, we established three different levels of water hemp seed bank to begin with in the, in the corn phase of the rotation. And those three levels of water hemp seed banks were, were established using three different herbicide programs in Liberty Link GT27 corn that was grown in the first year in 2019. So looking at the table here, uh, our herbicide programs were marginal, which is MHP, which, is, which was dual pre plus Roundup post. And again, it was just one effective side of action because Roundup was there to kill other existing weeds, but it was not effective on water hemp because water, water hemp at both the sites were resistant to glyphosate or Roundup. The second was aggressive herbicide program where we had three side of action of herbicides applied as pre and post, Sharpen plus Zidua pre, followed by Liberty plus dual post. And then the third tr treatment was the aggressive herbicide program plus weed seed removal at harvest, which is again the three side of action, same as the AHP, but we hand removed any uh, survivors of water hemp in those plots to prevent any seed bank inputs. So again, uh, from this slide onwards, uh, I will use this, uh, these terms, MHP, which is the marginal herbicide program, and AHP, which is the aggressive herbicide program. So what was the effect of the corn herbicide programs in 2019? Uh, again, the results uh, uh, were, pr were pretty evident here. As you can see on the picture, 2019 corn with one mode of side of action, uh, poor control of water hemp versus pretty good control of water hemp on the right hand side with the AHP, which is the aggressive herbicide program with three side of actions. So with these programs, we, we were definitely achieve, we were able to achieve our goal of, of starting with three levels of seed bank inputs in the corn, at the end of the corn, corn growing season, which you see on the right hand side on the graph is the water hemp seed in thousands per meter square. So with the marginal herbicide program in those plots, uh, the water hemp plants that survived, they, they, with the marginal herbicide program, they produced close to 90,000 seeds. Compared to the aggressive herbicide program, you see a, a pretty rapid decline in the seed bank inputs at the end of, this, of the corn season. And those, plant, uh, those plots or that particular treatment did produ uh, produce uh, uh, close to 10,000 seeds. So drastic reduction there. 
And of course, in the third treatment, we, we prevented any uh, seed going into the soil seed bank. But definitely there was a residual seed, soil seed bank of water hemp in that site. So uh, I, we did not expect that even by removing all the seeds in that particular third treatment, uh, we, uh, we did not completely eliminate, eliminate the water hemp uh, soil seed bank. Going into the soybean phase of the rotation in 2020, uh, our, uh, we, uh, within that aggressive and marginal herbicide programs, they were uh, further split into, into rye cover crop versus no cover crop. The rye was uh, variety Elbon was planted at 55 pounds per acre on October 10 of 2019, after, just after the corn harvest. And the rye was terminated at Anthesis. As you can see uh, in the picture here, the, it, was, uh, the, uh, it was planted green. The soybean was planted green on the rye and, and the rye was terminated on the same date of soybean planting on May 15 of 2020 with glyphosate. Our split split plot factor uh, within that rye and no rye cover crop, we further divided it into 15 inch soybean rows versus 13 soybean rows. So uh, in the soybean phase of the rotation, we uh, intentionally did not uh, use a effective herbicide program. We used a marginal herbicide program because we really wanted to see what the effect of the previous year's corn herbicide program is and what's the effect of this uh, cereal rye cover crop and, and 15 inch or narrow row soybean has on the water hemp seed bank. So this is the main effect of the cereal rye terminated at the time of soybean planting. And again, the biomass was 4,200 pounds per acre at the time of termination. So greater the biomass, the greater the levels of weed suppression. And we got to understand that uh, for practical weed management, especially for some of these late emerging weed species like water hemp, we definitely need to have a higher amount of biomass at the time of termination of cereal rye. So planting green definitely makes sense. So on the left-hand side, you see the no cover crop lots in between the soybean rows, a lot of water hemp pressure versus very less water hemp pressure uh, uh, on the, in the cereal rye cover crop plots. You see the amount of cereal rye residue in between those rows. So definitely the cereal rye had a complementary effect. The first one is reduced water hemp emergence and density and reduced growth, which means reduced size and biomass at the time of post application. Looking at the effect of narrow row soybeans on, on, on that glyphosate-resistant water hemp uh, control or, or management, you see a, a, a 30 inch rows on your left versus 15 inch rows. Again, with the early canopy development in 15 inch rows, uh, definitely helped in terms of, of reducing the density and emergence of water hemp. Again, a complementary strategy uh, using narrow rows to reduce the water hemp emergence, density, and size at the time of post application. So since the interaction of these uh, uh, previous year's herbicide program, uh, the cereal rye and narrow row spacing was significant. We are looking here uh, in this particular slide, we are looking at the uh, effect of corn herbicide programs, uh, cover crop and soybean row spacing on water hemp emergence uh, in, in the second year of the rotation, which was in the soybean phase. That's why I have listed the soybean treatments uh, from top to bottom is from T1 to two, T12 is the level of all those uh, programs, uh, start, uh, which, which uh, I would say the level of weed management uh, diversity or the level of intent or the intensity of weed management. So moving from T1 to two, T12, basically we are increasing the weed management diversity or intensity of weed management by incorporating cover crop and uh, narrow row soybean within those uh, corn herbicide program plots. So uh, as you can see in the right hand side, the results are pretty evident. This is the proportion of emerged water hemp during the soybean growing season. Uh, which we monitored from May up until August, which is the main emergence period for water hemp in Iowa uh, soybean production. So coming from T1, which is the light uh, green color, as you see on the top, what, uh, and the T12 is the highest level of diversity, uh, which is the aggressive plus weed seed removal in the corn phase, followed by cereal rye and 15 inch soybean in the in the soybean phase. So as you can see that we saw, as we are increasing the intensity of weed management and, and 
incorporating these cover crops and narrow row soybean with the aggressive herbicide program last year, definitely we are uh, reducing by 90% of the water ramp emergence in soybean in the following year. This is just an aerial image uh, of the field plots at the ISU Brunner farm in, uh, in 2020. Uh, you can see on the left hand side is the no cover crop with uh, 13 soybean versus cover, uh, no cover crop uh, and 15 in soybean. So basically we, the left two top and bottom we are looking at, uh, you can easily see what effect that 15 in soybean has in terms of reducing the, the water ramp in between those soybean rows as compared to the wide row soybean. Coming to the uh, right hand side, we see this, the rye cover crop grown in 13 soybean versus rye cover crop uh, grown in 15 in soybean. And again, integrating those systems, those cultural strategies of rye cover crop and 15 inch uh, row spacing, we are definitely at the bottom. You can see how clear the, uh, those plots are. Uh, even with minimal herbicide use in the soybean phase, we are still seeing uh, a, a, a dramatic effect, a, a, a drastic, a significant effect of cover crop and narrow row spacing uh, on water and pressure on those, in those plots. So effect of the corn herbicide programs, cover crop and soybean row spacing on water ramp control, uh, it not only to reduce the emergence, uh, uh, but also uh, here we are looking at the water ramp uh, total biomass production and seed production at the end of this uh, second year, which was soybean. So again, going from T1 to two, T12, we are going from a marginal herbicide program, uh, no cover crop, 13 soybean, which is the, our control, which is the least uh, uh, recommended or the least diverse weed management tactic versus the most diverse weed management tactic, which is the T12. We are seeing um, more than 90% reduction in the water and biomass uh, uh, as, uh, as a result of that. On the seed production, of water hemp plants in thousands per meter square, which you see on the y-axis on the right-hand side graph, uh, and the weed management diversity is moving from, from low to, to, to high diversity, where we are using an aggressive herbicide program and cover crop in 15 inch. We are seeing a, almost a steep decline, almost a linear decline as we are adding each of those uh, weed management tactics uh, in, in the toolbox. So definitely there, uh, there was 90% reduction in the treatment T12 compared to the uh, least effective T1 treatment uh, in terms of water and seed production in numbers per meter square. I'd like to emphasize here, uh, look at the y-axis on the right-hand side on the seed production of water and hemp uh, the, uh, from zero to 200,000 seeds. So under marginal condition, uh, herbicide program, now if you go back to the corn herbicide program, the year one, uh, the maximum was 90,000 seeds in the marginal herbicide program. In the same setup, um, set of treatment in the marginal herbicide program in the second year, now we are seeing 150 to 200,000 seeds. So that tells you that uh, why it is important to manage the weed seed bank, because if you are not if we are not managing the weed sand seed bank in the year one effectively, we are going to have end up with a bigger mess and, uh, and more uh, water and plants to deal with in the following year. One of the important things here is, as I mentioned here, we do, we, our, uh, our uh, soybean herbicide program was weak because we intentionally wanted to do that to see the effect of cover crop and, row, and soybean row spacing. But there were close to 10 to 15,000 seeds that were produced even with the most effective uh, weed management diversity or the maximum level of weed management diversity uh, with, the, uh, with the treatment T12. So those 15,000 seeds per meter square of water hemp is enough to cause seed bank replenishment uh, for the subsequent growing season. So definitely, I've highlighted on the top, uh, as you can see, an effective pre followed by post residual programs in soybean is much needed. Uh, and the major conclusions from this research is, of course, we did not see an adverse effect of delayed cover crop termination timing on soybean canopy growth uh, on soybean growth, canopy development, and yield. Uh, soybean yields were higher, definitely, uh, in those plots which, which had the AHP aggressive herbicide program, rye and reduced row spacing soybean. Cover crop and narrow row soybeans, again, those are complementary strategies. Those are not standalone strategies, uh, but definitely they are complementary because they can reduce the size, density, 
uh, and the number of weed seeds that are produced in one growing season. So overall, if you're reducing the density and size of the weed seeds, you're enhancing the efficacy of the post programs. Uh, and also it allows us to, pro when you are using these cultural strategies, it allows us a greater flexibility for application of our post herb herbicides. So when we are seeing less number of uh, uh, weeds, when the, uh, uh, at the time of post-herbicide application, definitely we are reducing the herbicide exposure of those weed seedlings and reducing the selection pressure for resistance development. So that's the, that's the complementary strategy we get from these integrated programs. Uh, of course, I would like to emphasize uh, that layered soil residual programs will with multiple sites of action will still serve as the foundation of our weed management programs uh, in both corn and soybean phase of the rotation. So even with that, when we are integrating uh, all these strategies together, the water hemp has evolved resistance to, to several different herbicides, multiple resistance. Uh, it can evolve very, um, uh, or it can adapt very fast to any weed management practices or control practices. So definitely at the end of the growing season, we are going to see probably one or two plants even surviving per meter square, which on a per acre basis is going to be a, a pretty significant number. So what we can do at the time of harvest as a late weed seed bank management tactic to capture those weed seeds at harvest. So this here uh, for, uh, slide here shows uh, what, you, uh, what you would expect from combine. Uh, uh, the weed seeds, I would like to emphasize that, are in the chaff fraction of this chaff and straw that comes out of your chopper at the rear of the combine. So if you put a baffle in between uh, then you can separate the straw which is the, uh, which is the brown color material from the chaff, which is the blue, blue color material, which is coming out of the combine. So with that baffle, you can separate the straw and chaff and all your chaff, uh, weed seeds are within the chaff. So if you can collect those chaff with containing the weed seeds and destroy them, I think uh, we are going to, to definitely have a strong impact in the amount of infestation in the following growing seasons. So uh, we, we started investigating back in 2019, and this is my graduate student, Avery Bennett, looking at some of these harvest weed seed control, non-conventional strategies, and uh, uh, as a non-chemical strategy that we can integrate in our soybean, corn soybean rotations. So Avery looked at uh, the water hemp seed retention uh, again in 2020, as you can see here, uh, even across the different harvest dates, even with the, uh, with the, uh, so, uh, why this harvest weed seed control technologies are going to work for, for big weeds like water hemp and palmer remnant is because they still retain um, 80 to up to 95% of the seeds depending on the time of, uh, of the harvest uh, of soybeans. So even with the late harvest, as you can see uh, on October 1, those water hemp plants are still re retaining close to 80% of the seeds, uh, which can be captured and destroyed. So we are going to, I'm going to talk about two technologies that we are uh, from a harvest weed seed control technology that we are investigating in Iowa uh, soybean production. One is the chaff lining and second is the seed destructor. First, I'm going to talk about the chaff lining concept. So uh, we collected chaff at the time of soybean harvest in 2019 uh, and we calculated the chaff to grain ratio of one is to six, which means one ton of soybean per six tons of soybean, uh, one ton of, of chaff, sorry, per six tons of soybean grain. So greater the soybean yield, greater the amount of chaff you are going to get. So based on that six is to one ratio, six tons of soybean and one ton of, of chaff, we calculated the uh, different amount of chaffs we, we can get from, uh, from uh, under different soybean yield scenarios, 40 bushel, 50 and 60 bushel soybean. Looking at the uh, emerge, uh, what is the effect of that soybean chaff on, on water hemp emergence? On, on the right hand side, you see uh, some of the pictures. We started with the greenhouse screening where we collected that soybean chaff that was collected in the field and we, we, uh, we put those chaff in, in trays uh, on top of the bare soil. So first uh, one in the picture on the, on, on the right hand side, you see no chaff. You see a lot of water hemp emerging there. And each of these trays has 100 water hemp, 1,000 water hemp seeds mixed, uh, put on the bare soil or mixed with the chaff. The second treatment is the 354 pounds per acre of the soybean chaff, which is equivalent to 40 bushel soybean. 443 pounds per acre is equivalent to 50 bushel soybean. And the 530 pound per acre is equivalent to 60 bushel soybean. So, 
on the y-axis, you see the proportion of immersed water temp during, and on the x-axis, the duration of emergence, which was 45 days after planting the, or after, after starting the experiment. The top line is the no chaff, the red line, as you see, as the amount of chaff increases, we see a drastic reduction in the emergence or cumulative emergence of water hemp. And of course, with the highest uh, amount of chaff, which was uh, from the 60 bushel soybean, which is the green line, you see there was a 90, more than 90% reduction in the cumulative emergence of water hemp compared to the no chaff. Similarly, we saw this effect not only in water hemp, but also in other weed species like velvet leaf. There was a suppression there as well. As you can see in the slide, on the, uh, in the graph on the left, as well as the pictures with and without chaff, uh, velvet leaf emergence suppression as a result of the chaff. Also for some of the grassy species, the most troublesome being the giant foxtail in, in Iowa. Uh, we, we definitely, as compared to the red line, which is no chaff, and the uh, green line, which is the chaff equ equivalent to 60 bushel soybean, we see close to 65 to 70% reduction. Of course, it was less as compared to, to what, we, what we saw for water hemp. And that's what we, uh, we are trying to see in this particular slide, is the effect of varying rates of the soybean chaff. And those rates are based on the soybean yield potentials starting from 40 up to 70 bushel soybean, we are seeing that uh, uh, the water hemp is the most sensitive species with, as you, uh, with, as you can see in the graph with, with the bottom line, uh, greater reduction as a result of the chaff as compared to velvet leaf and giant ragweed. So smaller the weed size, the greater the level of, of suppression you would expect because of the burial of those weed seeds in the chaff and also because of other mechanisms which we are going to investigate. This is the, uh, not only we saw a reduction in the emergence, but the soybean chaff can also reduce the size and growth of those emerged weeds, which is again a complementary role. If you remember that when, when I talked about narrow row soybean and uh, cover crops, their complementary role was, was to reduce also the size and growth at the time of post application. So that's what we are also achieving from soybean chaff. So it's a complementary strategy as well. Looking at the velvet leaf on the left hand side, the first two uh, the, is the bare soil. You can see the velvet leaf uh, and the chaff. In chaff, the, those plants that have emerged are much smaller. Coming to the right hand side, which is green foxtail, comparison between bare soil and chaff. In the chaff, again, those plants are weaker and much smaller as compared to when they are growing in bare soil in the absence of the chaff. So we start, uh, uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the study when we uh, took this study into the field and using the, uh, trying to evaluate this concept of chaff lining. Uh, we started these field experiments uh, this year in 2020. Uh, I would like to mention here that uh, chaff lining uh, as a harvest weed seed control has been widely adopted by growers in, in Western Australia because they are fighting uh, for uh, with this herbicide resistant weed species, especially uh, ryegrass, which is resistant to probably nine or ten different sites of action of herbicides. So it's even much more intensified as compared to what we see here with Palmer and water hemp in the U.S. Uh, chaff lining is, is uh, one of the most inexpensive method of harvest weed seed control. Uh, and we do have at ISU, we got uh, this fall, these chaff lining shoots and the, and the kit from uh, a company based in uh, Australia and it, uh, including the shipping cost and the equipment cost, it, uh, the total was in the range of uh, th uh, three to 3,500 to $5,000. So it is relatively inexpensive when you compare it with some of the uh, uh, other harvest weed seed control uh, technologies like Harrington seed destructor or, or any other seed destructors which are uh, pretty costly. Uh, it was easy to install for us uh, and we installed it in a John Deere uh, S-Series 660 combine and, and you can see that the, the, that's the shoot uh, and at the bottom you see that's where the all the, the chaff and the weed seeds are coming uh, as uh, in a narrow band at, right at the center of the combine. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. So let's look at this video where uh, uh, we had this uh, chute, uh, the chaff lining chute uh, installed be behind the John Deere 
S660 combine, uh, and you can see this uh, chute is right at the center of that combine, uh, trying to divert all uh, or concentrate all the weed seeds within the chaff in a narrow band at the center of the combine. This was tested across uh, uh, multiple locations here in central Iowa. This year, this was the first testing uh, of this chaff lining installed in a, in a John Deere combine, first time in the United States. So these are some of the field studies. And, and again, uh, this is one of the uh, grower field. You see the water hemp infestation at the time of harvest. Pretty, pretty good infestation of water hemp in that particular field where we had this chaff lining experiment uh, going on. Uh, and you see the chaff, how the weed seeds, uh, how this chaff line is a narrow band uh, within that 35 foot header width, that was the header width of the combine. And we are concentrating uh, all the weed seeds within that narrow band at the center of the, that 35 feet. So what we are achieving with this is we are uh, preventing the spread of herbicide resistant weed seeds across the entire field. So instead of the 35 feet wide, uh, 35 feet width, we are now concentrating all the weed seeds within that uh, 18 to 20 inch band, which is six to eight inches deep, at the, right at the center of that 35 feet uh, one pass combine. So definitely uh, on a per acre basis, we made the calculations. We, we found that we are reducing the spread of resistant weed seeds by 20 fold by doing this. So we collected some samples, as you can see my graduate students, Avery Bennett and, and Ram and others here, uh, trying to evaluate the number of weed seeds that we captured in the tray versus what comes out of the chaff, uh, out of the straw faction coming out of the chopper, uh, had a loss of the weed seeds at the time of soybean harvest as well. So uh, this is what the data suggest, uh, of, uh, and uh, more than 95% of the weed seeds that we have captured this fall in those chaff lines, uh, uh, I mean, ha have been captured in those chaff lines. Uh, we are seeing like within one square feet, we are, we, we are getting close to more than 8,000 water hemp seeds. So that's a drastic amount of weed seeds that we are concentrating within, within the narrow bands, much easier to manage and preventing the spread. So uh, the efficacy of, of the system was 95% in capturing those weed seeds. We are uh, putting down some, uh, we have put uh, some weed seed packets in, both inside and outside the chaff lines this fall to evaluate the efficacy of those, uh, of this system, the chaff lining on water hemp seed survival as a result of predation and decay uh, in, in those chaffs versus on bare soil. Uh, and also we are going to monitor the emergence of water hemp and other weed species in the subsequent growing season, which is going to be corn next year planted uh, in, in, in those fields. So the main uh, uh, question that we have, we don't know the answer because this is the first time this research has been conducted here in the U.S. As, uh, how we are going to manage those emerged weed seedlings in these chaff lines. Uh, uh, so we are thinking about shielded sprayer applications as well as how the herbicide applications, the pre-emergence programs, post-emergence and the pre-followed by post programs in corn is going to interact with those chaff lines with the ultimate goal to prevent any seed production from emerged uh, weed species in those chaff line definitely uh, that is going to be our main goal. The next technology we are going to talk about is the harvest weed seed control technology and again uh, this work was funded by USDA area-wide project. On the left-hand side, you see the combine. And on the right-hand side, you see the combine with the weed seed destructor. And that's the John Deere S680 combine, uh, which, uh, we, we have, uh, which belongs to a grower here in central Iowa, uh, in Gilbert, central Iowa, uh, where this uh, unit, ready cop seed destructor unit, was installed. You can see at the bottom uh, of that unit is where those high-impact mills are, which are basically pulverizing the weed seeds uh, as it as the chaff passes through that uh, high impact mill. So experiments were conducted uh, in, uh, in this year in the fall of 2020. The, this is the first testing of Redicop model in US. Uh, you might have heard about Harrington seed destructor and seed terminator tested in Missouri, Arkansas, and Illinois. But this is the uh, this Redicop seed destructor is going to be available for growers. Uh, 
uh, as a part of, as an add-on with the John Deere Combine. So John Deere has a uh, contract with this company, Redicop, which is based in Saskatoon, Canada. Uh, so we were the first time we tested this uh, in the fall 2020 of this year in, central, in several different fields in central Iowa at the time of soybean harvest and also at the ISU research farms. So I'm going to show you the, uh, the, a video of how this uh, system works. So this is the S680 John Deere combine, as you can see here. And at the bottom, at the rear of the combine, you see the, all the chaff and the weed seeds getting like a powder coming out of the back of the combine from that unit. And from the top also, from the chopper, you are still getting the, the straw, but all the weed seeds are getting pulverized from the bottom. A lot of dust scenario right there, but it does work, definitely. So we, uh, before we ran this seed destructor unit, we also sam uh, uh, we were sampling for the header loss of the weed seeds at the, uh, as the combine passes through, and also looking at the thresher loss and, and collecting the weeds, uh, seeds which were in the chaff com coming out of the seed destructor unit to test their efficacy. And we found out, uh, just got the results uh, uh, this week, that uh, it was pretty effective in, in pulverizing the small uh, one to two millimeter water and seeds, almost like 99% efficacy. Those seeds were rendered non-viable. It was almost looked like a powder. Uh, and we are going to do some further evaluations to, to understand the efficacy on other, other different weed species uh, in our corn soybean production system. So overall, what we are achieving, we are achieving uh, the, definitely, these are long-term benefits. There are long-term benefits of this harvest weed seed control non-conventional strategies. And uh, this is an excellent uh, data here from Western Australia uh, looking at annual ryegrass in plants per meter square density over, it, over it, a, a period from 2001 to 2016, so over a 15-year period. The green line represents herbicide, which is most likely glyphosate, uh, plus a harvest HWSC, which represents harvest weed seed control, which in this case was chaff lining because it was widely adopted uh, by the growers in Western Australia. So what do you see here? Uh, the red line is, is just the herbicide program, just the glyphosate, for example. What do you see here is the, the initial uh, six to seven years, the initial decrease in the ryegrass population was, was because the glyphosate was effective, right? But after that, in the, you see the red line, the trend is still the same pretty much in the next 10 years. Five to 10 plants per meter square are still there. However, when we are integrating that herbicide with a harvest weed seed control method like chaff lining, they were able to reduce the, uh, with that integrated system, the annual ryegrass population was, was reduced within, uh, you can see like in 2012-2013 it, it almost is zero plants per meter square. Uh, so definitely there is a long-term benefit of uh, some of these integrated non-conventional uh, non strategies like harvest weed seed control technologies that have large uh, that have large scale and, and definitely more implications uh, with regards to adoption and implementation in Iowa soybean production systems uh, when we talk about preserving the utility of existing herbicide and herbicide technologies. Uh, we are looking at these improved systems, these integrated systems in uh, at several different grower fields in collaboration with Iowa Soybean Association on-farm network where we are looking at dry cover crop soybean planted in narrow versus wide rows with and without seed destructor units. So definitely, we really want to in enhance the adoption of these integrated weed management programs. One of the research that we are also looking at, some of this precision weed management uh, uh, technologies like uh, flying uh, drones or UAVs based hyperspectral imaging so that we can uh, develop prescriptive maps for herbicide resistant weeds, for example, water hemp in this particular soybean field, as you can see here. Uh, <clears throat> so that definitely will help us to, uh, to, to either uh, develop more effective weed management program or spot uh, treatment applications to control those herbicide resistant weed patches in the field. So uh, this is one of the research that we conducted earlier. You can see the prescriptive map uh, which definitely will help us to make better weed management decision in the following season. 
I would like to uh, thank all my uh, collaborators, multi-state state collaborators across the Midwest and the Southern US, uh, mm -hmm. and also these funding agencies, including USD and NIFA, North Central Share, United Soybean Board, Iowa Soybean Association, and North Central Soybean Research Promotion Board. And also I'd like to acknowledge uh, industry uh, and thanks to thanks to uh, multiple industry sources for providing funding for for this research. We recently got a grant from USDA CIG program, which is a, uh, a close to $2.5 million grant to work on this sustainable weed management technologies in corn and soybean production in the US and also looking at precision weed management technologies. With that, I'd like to acknowledge my entire weed science crew, uh, excellent group of graduate students, Alexis, Ryan, uh, Avery, Rom, and, and Steven. Uh, Austin Sklitch is also joining um, my graduate, uh, graduate program here at Iowa State. And also I'd like to thank um, Ryan and, uh, sorry, Damien and uh, Alex uh, as the research staff for our program. So these guys are tremendous. The, uh, the, the, uh, their work is, is, is definitely very significant for what, uh, what we are uh, doing and what we can achieve in the near future in the ISU weed science program. With that, I, would, uh, I end my presentation and would like to entertain any questions uh, if you have. Thank you.